Moving on to CPUs now. In CPUs, each compute unit also makes available to the OS a number of threads, a number of hardware threads. And it's usually about two to four. These threads are independent of each other. So those, those threads can run their own set of instructions. They're not constrained to operate in lockstep with each other. CPU hardware threads are more agile as well. So they're a lot quicker. Um, memory access, those, those hardware threads um, have access to memory that has much lower latency than memory access from GPU. So although a GPU can do lots of things in parallel, it's not as nimble as a CPU hardware thread. Okay, so CPU hardware threads also have access to SIMD vector units to perform vector math operations. So AVX512, for example, can do 16 floating point, um, single precision 32-bit floating points in one operation using these SIMD vector units. However, this hardware is only accessed through special vector instructions that the compiler conservatively generates if it deems it is safe to do so. So if you want to get good performance using these SIMD vector units on a CPU, you have to make sure that the compiler is actually generating code that uses those SIMD vector units. And compilers don't want to do the wrong thing. And so often, often if the way your program is structured, um, if it looks like it's if it looks like it's unsafe to use those uh, vector instructions, then the CPU won't use them. So the compiler will generate code that does not use those vector instructions. So that's a little bit of a barrier to getting good performance on CPUs. With GPUs, the SIMT, um, the way that the SIMT um, architecture is done is that it makes sure that it uses all those all those floating point units. So there's no there's no option here not to use them. <laughs> so with with CPUs, there is there is a bit of um, unless you explicitly define unless you explicitly use vector instructions within within your code, uh, it's up to the compiler whether or not it generates instructions that use these SIMD vector units. Okay, so moving on to blocks and threads. So a HIP implementation is a way to run kernel instances in software threads over the available hardware threads of a compute device. The implementation provides a way to upload and download memory to and from compute devices. So you've got compute devices and they have memory attached to them global memory. So for example, um, the MI250X GPUs have 64 gigabytes of global memory in this high bandwidth memory here. So each GPU has 64 gigabytes of memory available. We specify how many kernel instances we want to run. When we launch the kernel, uh, we define a 3D execution space called a grid. And so that's a 3D space, and we specify its size at kernel launch. So every time we launch a kernel, we specify the size of the grid that these threads are meant to run in. After launch, every point in this grid is visited by exactly one running instance 
of the kernel. So you might have, you know, in nested loops, you might use nested loops to visit every element of an array. Well, with HIP, a grid is um, a similar concept in that you're creating a space for kernels to visit. So every every um, point in that grid was going to be visited by a kernel, and that kernel is going to run on the hardware threads inside your compute device. So in HIP and CUDA terminology, an instance of a kernel is called a thread. So that's big T to distinguish it from hardware threads and software threads. In OpenCL, it is called a work item. So an instance of a kernel in HIP and CUDA is called a thread. In OpenCL, it is called a work item. So this is what a grid, this is a grid, this is like a conceptual, um, yeah, conceptual understanding of a grid. So we have dimension X, dimension Y, and dimension Z. These orange squares represent thread blocks or wavefronts that have finished. And um, these white squares represent unfinished threads. So a grid, a grid is divided up into 3D blocks. And each of these blocks, each of these blocks um, have teams of wavefronts or warps that work on them. So each of these blocks, even though there's, there's several, there can be several teams that work on a particular block, every thread that is in a block has access to things like shared memory. So every thread in a block has access to its own memory, but it also has access to local memory or memory that is shared amongst the elements or amongst other threads in a block. But it also, every thread in a block has access to memory on global memory. So that is memory on the compute device. So that is a grid. Grids are divided into blocks. So that's a block here. And every item inside the block is called a thread. And a thread is a running kernel. So yeah, so that's what... Um, now, another word for blocks in OpenCL is called a work group. So you have your grid, then you have your blocks, otherwise known as work groups in OpenCL, and then you have threads, otherwise known as work items in OpenCL. So all threads in a block have access to shared resources such as shared memory. And there might, there, sorry, there may be more than one wavefront uh, in a block. So a block might be big enough that two wavefronts can be active. For example, it's good practice to make sure that your block size is big enough to support an integer number of wavefronts. So with this block here, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, five by four is 20. So that is not, that block here is not big enough uh, to have a complete wavefront working on it. So that's a suboptimal block size. You need to have, for performance, you need to have blocks that can support an integer number of thread teams. So a good block size would be 64 threads or 128 threads or even 256 threads. There is a limit 
on the number of threads that you can have in a block and the implementation sets that limit usually with CUDA and AMD devices I think the thread limit is around about a thousand and twenty four threads per block okay so in the example above the grid is of size 10 by 8 by 2 and each block is of size 5 by 4 by 1. The number of blocks in each dimension is then 2 by 2 by 2. Yep. So as we were saying before, every thread has access to device memory that it can use exclusively. And this is called private memory. And those, that private memory lives on registers inside the compute device. Okay, so private memory or local memory. So that is available to a thread just for its use. A thread can have access to memory that all its neighboring threads in the block can use, and that's called shared memory. And threads can have access to memory that other threads in other blocks can use, and that is global, constant, and texture memory. So during execution, every kernel can query its location within the grid. And you can use that location to reference um, reference inside allocations of memory inside compute devices. So a kernel is here and it um, is using its position within the grid to work out where it needs to access memory from from the global memory space. So there is so this is GPU memory, for example, memory that's allocated in the memory of a GPU, and a kernel is accessing memory inside that global allocation. So the so, above um, concept. Sorry, um, I think Ash. Has the question he asked, is it eight by eight block size? Um, is the right block size eight by eight? That's a that's a good question, Ash. Um, it actually depends on your algorithm. What you can do is you can um, you can vary the block size within your algorithm, and it will have a block size that works best. So eight by eight is a good general choice or even 16 by 16. That is also a good general choice for the block size. But, um, but performance in specific is going to be specific to both the architecture and your algorithm. Yeah, does, um, does that make sense? So, so what you can do is that you can try a few different block sizes in your algorithm and then use the one that provides the best performance for that particular GPU. Excellent, yep, yep. Yeah, so when you're developing applications, um, when you're developing applications, um, try try having a look at the performance of a few different block sizes. You might be surprised just how much of a difference it can make. Having said that, a square block size of eight by eight, because that will yield 64 threads or 16 by 16 because that will yield 256 threads. Um, those are reasonable first pass choices. Yep. Excellent. I think Liam has posted. Yep. 
Okay, so just, just checking over the comments here. Uh, Ronald has posted, yep, there's a book available for HIP. Accelerated computing with HIP. Um, yeah, I've got that, I've got that book too. Um, yep, there's um, some cDNA white paper in the chat. You can have a look at that for more details on the architecture. That's very good. Um, yeah, Ronald is saying it's the only textbook for HIP at the moment. Hopefully that will change. <laughs> Yeah, okay, cool. All right. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go back to. So now let's talk about the elements of an accelerated application. So in every accelerated application, there is a concept of a host computer with one or more compute devices. So on Cytonix, there are eight available GPUs or eight available compute devices for each GPU node. The host usually has the largest memory space so in the case of Cytonix, that memory space is 230 gigabytes of available memory. And the compute device usually has the most compute power um, and memory bandwidth. Well, actually, having said that, I think the amount of GPU memory in total, because you've got eight GPUs and each is 64, um, so you have more memory <laughs> available now on the GPUs then. Than the host. But historically, um, the host usually has more, more memory available. So the host usually has the largest memory space, and the compute device usually has the most compute power and memory bandwidth. So that's why we say that an application is accelerated by the compute devices because they can perform the math more quickly. So at compilation, um, a HIP source file will have both kernel code and host code. So at compilation, the kernel code and the host code are separated out. The kernel code gets compiled to an intermediate uh, representation for further compilation at runtime, and the host code gets compiled down to machine code. So then at runtime, the host executes the application, and then the HIP runtime either selects the binary kernel that was that was made during the compilation step, or it uses just-in-time compilation techniques to ready the kernel for the compute device. So the HIP runtime, or so during compilation, HIP CC might compile the code all the way down to binary or it might compile it to an intermediate representation. And then when that kernel is run, it gets compiled the rest of the way um, for the specific GPU architecture. So this means that the first run of the kernel, and the same is true with CUDA, the first run of the kernel can take longer than other runs. It depends on whether or not this JIT compilation step has taken place. The host program manages memory allocations on the compute device, and it launches kernels on the compute device. So for instances where the compute device is a CPU, uh, the host CPU and the compute device are the same, the same thing. So accelerated applications follow the same logical progression of steps. Compute devices are discovered memory is allocated on the compute devices. Memory is then copied from the host to the compute devices. Kernels are JIT compiled or just in time compiled for first use and then they're cached and then they run on the compute devices. So 
With OpenCL, you have to compile the kernels explicitly within your program. In HIP and CUDA, this can take place in the background without intervention. You can, of course, um, if you wish to, you can, of course, pre-compile your kernels and then load them at runtime. The host then waits for any kernels that have been launched to finish. Then memory is copied back from the compute devices to the host, and you can repeat these steps as many times as is necessary before finishing. And then when you finish, you just clean up resources and then exit. So that's how an that's how an accelerated application would work. We discover resources, allocate memory on those resources, uh, copy memory to those resources, compile and run kernels, wait for the kernels to finish, copy memory back, repeat as many times as necessary, then clean up and exit. So here's the taxonomy of a HIP application. So we've got our host here, and we've got our, at the very base level, we've got our platform. So this can be HIP Clang, it can be CUDA, it can be Intel Level Zero or even OpenCL. So I think there are some implementations out there that can run HIP over OpenCL. Within, oh sorry, on top of your platform are contexts and each device is in its own context. So a context can be thought of as a resource manager for the kernels that are running and the resources that are allocated on a compute device. So yeah, just think of a context as a resource manager. So we have our devices in here and each of these two devices um, exist on the platform, each device has its own context. And within the context in the device, you can allocate memory. And we're calling these allocations buffers. Um, and that's their open seal name as well as a, as a buffer. So on those devices, you can run kernels. So kernels are specialized bits of software that run within a context and they operate on memory that is in a device. Above, what I see as balloons sort of above is streams. So streams, um, streams are like queues that you submit work to. So you submit work to a stream and then that work will then run on the device inside the context. So yeah, you can have you can have many different streams for a compute device. And by having many different streams, you can run work on one stream at the same time as running work on another stream. And so that's how you can achieve uh, concurrent um, concurrent compute or concurrent IO with compute devices. So you have many different streams and each of those streams can have events attached to them. So you might submit a kernel to a stream and it will run on that stream on the compute device. And then an event will enable you to poll when that stream is finished. So it'll allow the host to uh, poll or use the event to poll when a particular bit of work, that work could be a kernel or it could be a memory copy, for example. So events can be used to um, establish dependencies between work in streams, but it can also be used to uh, time the events, uh, so time the work that happens in a stream. So that's the that's the basic sort of taxonomy of a um, of a HIP application. So it has this platform, context, devices, buffers, kernels, streams, and events. And I think all that 
all that text there is just explaining what that diagram that what that diagram is. So how do we install HIP? So HIP is bundled with the AMD tool set Rockham. And you can click on this link to find out how to install Rockham. That will take you through to an AMD, an AMD page docs.amd.com. And I would recommend using one of the supported operating systems to avoid pain with installation. Uh, I've had a lot of success using Ubuntu uh, because that is one of the officially supported operating systems. Um, and of course, um, with, with the Tonics, um, with their open source operating system, Rockham is supported as well. So if you would like to use the NVIDIA backend for HIP programs, you also need to install CUDA. But there might be a compatibility issue between HIP and CUDA if CUDA has recently gone through a major release. So, for example, um, CUDA 12 came out, but HIP wasn't ready for that. So if you're going to install CUDA, preference an established version of CUDA instead of the bleeding edge one. That will that's a um, that's a strategy for the least amount of pain when trying to uh, use HIP with the CUDA backend. So here are some other HIP implementations that might be useful. The HIP CPU runtime. Uh, you can click on this GitHub link that will take you across to a header only. C++ library that allows for HIP application development when you do not have um, an AMD or NVIDIA GPU to use. So that, that allows you to develop HIP applications on your laptop, for example, if you don't have um, an integrated GPU. So the chip SPV runtime, I haven't had experience with this. That is for running HIP over OpenCL and the Intel level zero backends. So I think for some supercomputers who are using the Ponte Vecchio architecture, this might be a way to do that. 